Hey there, it's Tom Corson Knowles, number one best-selling author of Secrets of the Six-Figure Author and founder of TCK Publishing. I'm so excited you're back here for video number two on what it actually takes to earn a full-time income as an author. Now, in this video, we're going to talk about income-producing activities. So what you're going to learn here in video number two are the key success factors you can control as an author, no matter you know whether you're traditionally published, self-published, you know whatever publishing route you're going, these are success factors that you have control over. And we're going to talk about exactly what to do and how to do it to guarantee your success. Right now, I can't guarantee you're going to become a millionaire, right? And it's probably not going to happen overnight. But I can guarantee if you follow this formula, if you focus on the key activities that actually determine your income as an author, your income will grow. Right now, I don't know if your income is going to grow from $1 to $2 a month or if it's going to grow from $1 to a $1 million a month, right? The numbers are almost irrelevant. The key factor is that you have to focus on what actually makes a difference. You see, the biggest mistake most folks make is that it's so easy to get distracted, right? We spend all this time on Twitter and Facebook and social media, and you know we trick ourselves into thinking that what we're doing is growing our business and helping us sell more books. But if you look back at the end of the month and you look at your income, you look at the results, you look at what you actually did that month, you gotta ask yourself, is what you're doing actually leading you to achieve your goals? And if it's not, you have to change. And so this video is all about understanding what are the key things, what are the small handful of things, there's only less than half a dozen things that you can do and should be doing day in, day out that will determine how much income you make. And so we're gonna talk about those right here in this video. All right, so number one, we talked about this in the last video, is market research. You have to understand your readers so you can serve them better. This is absolutely crucial. There is nothing more important than understanding your market. And here's why. I mean, think of famous artists you know. Like, think of someone like Vincent Van Gogh. I mean, this was a guy who, you know, even today is hailed as one of the greatest artists ever to exist. But you know what? He died broke. He died a starving artist. Why? because he didn't understand his market. He didn't understand his audience. He didn't understand how to market and promote his work in a way that his audience, his customers at that time could appreciate. It wasn't until after he had died that his work became famous and he became known as a great artist that he truly was while he was alive, right? And so, you know, being the best writer in the world is wonderful, but you know who cares if you're the best writer in the world if no one knows about it, right? If no one understands the value of your work, then it doesn't matter. Like no one's going to read your work. No one's going to appreciate the incredible art and beauty and gift and love that you put into your work if you don't understand your audience and understand how to serve them and connect with them and understand the words that are going to allow you to connect with them and get them to buy from you, to read your books, and to to enjoy the art that you've created. Now what I want to do is just walk you through my Amazon market research process real quick live on Amazon so you can see the exact process that I go through and the exact process I recommend you go through every single time you're publishing a new book, okay? So here's the link on the screen. It's tckpublishing.com slash Amazon categories. Just go ahead and click that link uh, underneath this video or just go ahead and type that in uh, in your web browser and you can follow along. Okay, so when we go to that link, we're going to come to this page on Amazon for the Amazon Kindles bestsellers. These are the Amazon Kindle bestseller categories, okay? Now, we're gonna focus on researching uh, eBooks right now because that's the biggest market for most authors in most markets. You can also go back here, click Kindle Store, and click any department, and you can click Books, and that will take you to the area where you can actually research physical books. So if you're, you know, you're coming up with like a journal or something that's only going to be a physical book and it's not going to be an ebook, you can do your research in here. Now I recommend you do your research uh, both in the book section and the Kindle section if you are publishing ebooks as well as physical books. But for the sake of demonstration, just to be, you know, the most value of our time here, we're going to really focus on this process for ebooks. Okay, so once we're here, we can uh, either just browse the bestseller list here to find the top books in our market, or we can type in keywords to find bestselling books in our market. So I'm just going to go over to business and money, and we're going to do some market research in this area. So what you want to do is find the most relevant categories for your book. So if you're writing a book on real estate, here we go. We can check out the real estate bestseller lists on Kindle, 
And then we can see there's even more subcategories here. So we can check out the buying and selling homes category. And then once you've found the best selling books in your market, what you want to do is go ahead and first of all, start studying them, right? Start understanding, you know, what are these, what are these authors doing and, and how are they packaging their book, right? One of the biggest parts of marketing is packaging, right? It, it's creating a book cover, creating a book title, creating a brand around your book that resonates with your audience. So what do you want to do is study the best selling books in your market and take a look at their book covers, take a look at their book titles and jot down ideas, jot down notes of the, the best selling book covers, the best selling book titles, the subtitles, uh, the book descriptions, the, the words that stand out, that, that connect with you, that you think we're going to connect most with your audience. Take notes of all that so you can model that when you're creating your book covers and your titles and your subtitles and your book descriptions. Okay, so here's what you want to look for when you click on the best-selling books in your market. So the title and subtitle are going to be up here. So go ahead and study those. Take notes of the you know titles and subtitles you think really stand out and do a great job in your marketplace. Then you're going to read the book descriptions, read all the book descriptions for all the top books in your market and see the ones that stand out, what they do well and what they don't do well and take notes. So you notice this one has some nice bullet points here, but the spacing between the bullet points looks, you know, like a little bit too much, right? It's kind of hard to read. The bullet points don't really stand out very well. There's this part one here and part two here and there, you know, it, it's kind of nice, but it's not, it's not beautifully formatted, right? It, it could be done a little bit better. And so these are some of the things you want to notice as you're going through this process. But also, obviously, you want to notice not just the formatting and the layout of the descriptions, but what are the words they're using? Are they captivating you? Are they getting you interested? Are they getting your ideal readers interested in these books? And are they actually converting readers to sales? Then what you want to do is actually scroll up here and click Look Inside. And you want to read the first one to two pages of all the best-selling books in your market. So, you know, skip like the praise for this and the, the reviews and the blurbs and all that. And go to the actual beginning of the book and type and start to read, you know, the first one to two pages of all the best-selling books in your market. And see how are they getting readers interested in what you're doing. How are they drawing in readers? Whether you're writing, whether you're writing fiction, nonfiction, it's the exact same process, right? Uh, when someone opens up your book and they look inside... They're going to start reading. Your ideal customer is going to start reading your book. And if they're not hooked immediately, if they're not drawn into the story, if they're not excited about the information you're going to share, they're going to click away. They're not going to buy. So study the best-selling books in your market and see how they do that. And make sure that the first one, two, five, ten pages of your book draws your reader in as well or better than any other book in your market. And that's how you can convert more browsers on Amazon into buyers. Now, another thing you want to do, and this is absolutely crucial, so few authors do this, but this is what's actually going to make you successful if you do this, if you really understand who your audience is, if you really do your market research, you're going to scroll down, and what you want to do is you want to read these reviews. See all these reviews here, all of them, five star, four star, three star, two star, one star, read every single review of all the best-selling books in your market, have a notebook in hand. And what you want to do when you're reading these reviews is you want to take notes. Take notes of all the common themes, the common elements, the common phrases you hear again and again from readers of things that they love about the best-selling books in your market and all the common things readers hate about the best-selling books in your market and create that list in your journal, all the things your readers love and all the things your readers don't like. And once you've done this, once you've read all the reviews of all the top books in your market, you are going to have a better understanding of exactly who your readers are and what they want better than anyone else in your market. Because almost no one else is doing this, right? There, there's so few people doing this. I've been teaching this for over two years now, and almost no author is actually doing this. But this is what will take your career to the next level, understanding who your customers are and what they want. And what that will allow you to do is, first of all, write better books, right? So if you see that everyone in your market you know, can't stand that, you know, all these nonfiction books are 300, 400 plus pages. They want something shorter. They want something with more action steps and more to the point. Well, there you go. You've just seen a huge need in your marketplace that's not being met. And so you can fill that need by understanding your customers, listening to your customers and giving them what they want, right? And the same applies for fiction as well. If you follow this process, you understand your customers. I mean, your customers are telling you every single day on Amazon, every single day on Amazon, this, this review is posted eight hours ago. Every single day on Amazon, readers are telling you in your market what they want and what they don't want. And if you're not listening, you know, how do you expect to be successful if you're not listening to your customers? If you're not listening to the people who are going to give you the money, like 
how do you expect to be successful? You have to listen. You have to understand your customers so you can give them what they want and so that you can position yourself and market yourself in a way that they resonate with. Another good tip when you're reading these reviews is take notes of some, some key phrases. Take, take notes of the phrases that are emotional that really stand out. So, if you, so for example, if you, see, if you have a weight loss book and you see people are talking about you know, burning fat or getting ripped or getting shredded or, or whatever these key phrases are that you see again and again and again, those are some key phrases and key words you can use in your book titles, in your subtitles, in your book descriptions to resonate with your customers. And you know that those words are going to resonate with your customers because those are the same words your customers are, are, are saying when they're writing reviews on Amazon, when they're laying in bed at night worrying about their problems. Those are the same words they're using, right? So jot down all the good ideas you get from reading your readers' reviews. And that will give you the tools, the information, the resources you need to write better books and to create better marketing copy for your books that will help you sell more books. Okay, now there are other things you can do for market research as well. So you can, you know, you can Google the top blogs in your market, the top forums in your market, and you can go there and you can read the top posts and the top articles and so forth. And here's the thing, like market research is something you want to be doing constantly. It's not just something you do one time. You, you, know, you go through this process on Amazon, you read all the reviews, you read the first one or two pages of the best-selling books in your market, and then you're done. Um, you're, you might be done you know, browsing on Amazon and reading all those reviews, but you're constantly doing market research. So when your readers email you, Right, and they're they're asking you questions, they're complaining, they're praising you. You know, jot down notes. And, you know, keep track of all this stuff that you're learning from your audience. This is going to help you get the ideas, the information you need to better serve your audience, to, to better serve your audience and your readers in the future. Okay, so market research is not something that you do once and you're done. You're going to do it. Uh, you know, intensely. You're going to follow this process I just taught you intensely. You know, before you write or publish your first book. But you're going to be constantly doing market research for the rest of your life because the better you understand your customers and readers, the better you're going to be able to market to them, the better you're going to be able to serve them, and the more money you're going to make, right? It just makes sense. So if you want to earn more money, do better market research. Understand who your customers are, understand what they want, and then give them what they want. Give them what they're asking for, and they will gladly pay you more money. They will gladly buy your books because you've given them what they've asked for. Now, step two is creative writing, right? The, the second thing you can do to dramatically increase your income is learn how to become a better creative writer. Now, I break up the writing process into creative writing and self-editing, right? So it's kind of like the two parts of your brain, the right brain, creative side, and the left brain, analytical side. And what I found in my experience, in my experience teaching tens of thousands of students online how to write better books is that if you separate the creative writing process from the left brain analytical self-editing process, you're going to become a much better, more effective writer. Because uh, if you constantly stop in the middle of a writing, of your writing, you know, a, a new chapter or a new book, and you're constantly stopping to fix typos and, you know, fact check and fix grammatical errors and rewrite sentences, it's kind of like you have one foot on the brake and one foot on the gas. You're not really going anywhere fast. So instead, if what you do is you focus on how can I get from the idea of my book to a finished first draft as fast as possible, what that will do by, by cutting out the analytical left brain side of the process, you no longer have that foot on the brake. And so you can be as creative as possible. You can be as inspired as possible. You can get in the zone in your writing sessions and you can write for 20 minutes, an hour, five hours, 10 hours without any blocks, without any barriers. And it allows you to create, right? Just like in a brainstorming session, if you probably heard about, you know, brainstorming sessions before, you know, the most important thing to do during a brainstorming session is not to analyze, right? You don't want to come up with 10 good ideas or 10 ideas and then have someone say, oh, but those bad, those ideas are terrible, they'll never work. You don't want to do that because that stops the creative process. Every time you analyze, you go analytical, you go into the left brain thinking, you're stopping the creative process and you're not going to be as productive. So if you can focus really just on creative writing, just on being creative from the idea to the first draft of your book, you're going to be a lot more productive, get a lot more done. And so one of the things that will allow you to actually do that, ironically, is actually using your left brain analytical thinking to create a plan, right? To create a plot. So what this allows you to do when you have a plan, when you have a clear vision and structure for every chapter and scene in your book is that it allows you to sit down at the computer and be creative, right? The structure that you're creating from creating a plot or, or a plan for your book or an outline for your book 
it gives you the tools you need so that when you're sitting down on the computer and your mind goes blank, you can look at your outline, you can look at your plot and say, oh, okay, now I'm working on scene four and this is what happens in scene four. Or now I'm working on chapter five and in chapter five, here are the three topics we have to cover. You already know what you have to do because you've planned it out ahead of time. And what happens once you have your outline, your plot, your plan in place is that you have structure and the structure is what supports your success. Write that down. Structure supports your success as a creative person. Every great house needs a good foundation. You can't build an amazing house that's going to stand and last and be a great home for many, many years if you don't have a good foundation. And that's not to say that you can't write a book without a plot or a plan or an outline. Of course you can. Many folks have done that. But what you'll find through practice, through experience, if you try this out, what you'll find is that you'll become much more creative and much more productive if you create the structure and the plan, the outline in the first place, and it doesn't take that much time, right? You can create an outline, a plot, a plan for your book in a day or less. And for most nonfiction writers, I mean, most folks can do it in like 30 minutes. You know, if you're planning out a novel and it's a brand new idea, it might take you several hours to do it or an afternoon to do it. But you can still create that entire plan, that, that entire outline for your book in a very short period of time. And I guarantee you, for every hour you spend planning, you're going to save 10 hours to 100 hours or more during the writing process because you're going to be that much more focused and clear on where you're going and what you're doing. A little bit of planning ahead of time will save you a ton of work in the long run. And this is something that I learned through experience and that many of my students have learned through experience as well. So, you know, I know there's this kind of uh, controversy out there in the writing world of pantsers versus plotters, right? So pantsers are over here on the left side of the screen and, you know, they don't plan ahead at all. They just sit down and just start writing their book. And plotters are folks who, you know, really meticulously plan and outline their book. And, you know, they, they plan out every scene, every chapter ahead of time. And I think you should be more towards the plotting end. Right? I think you should be more structured with your creativity because the more structure you have, the easier it is for you to go through that process, the less likely you are to get stuck. I mean, the, one of the biggest mistakes uh, that authors make is like we start a book and we quit, right? And so why do we quit? Why do we quit writing? Why do we quit? Because it gets hard. It gets difficult. We get these emotional thoughts and ideas in our mind that, oh, it's not working. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not good enough. No one's going to want to read this book, right? And you're more likely to get those negative thoughts. You're more likely to, have to run into those roadblocks when you don't have a plan in place. When you have your plan in place, writing your book is simple. All you do is you sit down every day, you look at your plot, you look at your outline, you say, oh, scene three, here's what I have to do. And you just follow step one, step two, step three, because you've already planned it out. And again, it doesn't take long to go through this process. I mean, you can plot your book, you can outline your book and, and in a very short period of time, just sit down with a pen and paper and write down, you know, what needs to be in chapter one? What needs to be in chapter two? What needs to be in chapter three? What are the main ideas I'm sharing in this book? You know, if you're writing a novel, what, is, what does the story look like? Uh, you know, what is the first scene, the second scene, and the third scene, the fourth scene, and so on? And if you just go through that simple analytical process, you will have the structure you need to become a much better creative writer. Because here's the thing, until you get the first draft done, you can't really bring someone in to help you improve your book, right? You know, try to go out and hire an editor for a half-written book. It's not going to work. You're, you're either going to end up spending way too much money and not getting good results, or they're just going to laugh at you and be like, hey, look, you know, you're not ready. You need to finish this book so that you have some kind of draft in place that we can work on, right? And so the most important thing that you need to do is go from idea to first draft, if you get really good at going from idea to first draft, I guarantee you, you can find some great editors, you can learn how to edit your own book, but if you can't go from idea to first draft, I mean, unless you're hiring ghostwriters, you're not going to be able to get there, right? So you need to master this process of going from idea to first draft, and I think having the plan in place, having that line, the plot of your book done before you start writing, or at least somewhere in the in the process, you know, maybe you get inspired and you're a pantser and you start writing a couple of chapters. If you ever get stuck, go back, get that plan, get that outline in place so you have the structure you need to finish the first draft. Because until the first draft is done, you have no hope of being successful. You have no hope of finishing the book. All right, now this book, uh, Rachel Aaron's book, 2000 to 10,000, it's called 2K to 10K. 
Uh, it's an amazing book. I just just go ahead and buy it. It's all about planning and plotting and how you structure the writing process to be a lot more productive. Whether you write fiction, nonfiction, this book will change how you think about the writing process. And it, it, I recommend it for everyone. So just go to tckpublishing.com slash 2K. That will take you to the book page. You can go ahead and buy that. I think it's like 99 cents on Amazon. Uh, so there's no reason not to buy it. It will change how you think about the writing process. It will dramatically increase your writing productivity. So go ahead and buy that book right now. Okay, now step three is the self-editing process. So once you've got the first draft done, now we need to focus on, on self-editing. And self-editing is what you do before you send your manuscript to editors or beta readers. So, you know, if you if you followed my process before, you've got that plan, you've got that outline in place, you know, you wrote the first draft and you rushed through it as fast as possible to get it done, then you know there's gonna be tons of typos and grammatical errors and mistakes all throughout your manuscript. And that's actually a wonderful thing, right? That's a great thing. Uh, that's normal. That's everyone goes through that. Every writer goes through that. And so your next step before you hire an editor, before you get beta readers or advisors to read your manuscript and give you feedback is to go through it yourself. By editing your manuscript yourself, it's gonna do a couple of things. First of all, it's gonna make sure that you understand what's actually going on in your book, right? So if there's major problems with your manuscript, it's better that you figure it out yourself rather than paying an editor hundreds or thousands of dollars to figure it out for you. The more you can figure out yourself, the faster you're gonna learn, the better writer you're going to become, and the better quality books you're going to produce over the long term. So go through the self-editing process. Now, I interviewed Steve Barry, one of the best-selling authors in the world. I mean, he sold over 19 million books, over 19 million books he has sold. And he says, look, I can go through a minimum 60 to 75 edits myself before he ever sends his book to an editor or a beta reader. And I think that level of commitment to success is what separates him from everyone else, right? It's what separates the great writers from folks who are just dabbling. Right, so if you're not willing to edit your book 10 to 75 times at a minimum yourself before you send it to an editor, before you get feedback from other folks, I think you're not really committed to your own success, right? And that's just the truth. If you're not willing to put in the work, the time, and the effort it takes, you're not committed to your own success. And that's sad, you know, and I can't teach you that. I can't teach you commitment. Right? I can't teach you how to you know, follow through on your dreams, right? That's up to you. If this is your dream to become a best-selling author. You want to earn a full-time income or more as an author. You have to commit to success. And this is what it takes, right? Now, having said that, when you're doing these 10 to 75 self-edits, not every edit is, is what you think, right? So what you want to do is you want to vary up the editing process. So instead of just reading from the first word to the last word every single time in the exact same way, 75 times, that's boring. And you're not going to get really great results if you do it that way. So there's a better way to do it. And here's what I've learned. So when you're self-editing your book, first thing you want to do is you want to start big and then you want to go small. So we're going to start up at the book level. So when you do your first read through of your manuscript, you're not focused on grammatical errors and typos and all that stuff. And if you find them, you know, by all means, fix them. There's no problem with that. But I think the most important thing when you do that first read through of your book is to read the entire book and analyze it at the book level. So you want to ask yourself questions like, you know, is this, is this book working? right? Is, is there, are there missing scenes? Are there missing chapters? Is there missing information? Is everything there? Is it all organized properly? Is everything in the right place, right? Because if you've got holes in your story, or if you've got holes in your manuscript, there's chapters missing, there's information missing, you got to fill that stuff in, right? And so it's better that you fill it in now at the beginning of the process than trying to fill it in later, right? A big mistake you make is you know the first edit of your manuscript you go through and you, you know you're fixing all these typos and grammatical errors and you're using thesauruses and dictionaries to find the right words and you know you're editing at the individual word level but you haven't figured out if your book even works yet right it's be like if you're if you're inspecting a house you know a house a brand new house has just just been built and you walk in the front door and you see this hardwood floor down there and there's a gaps between the hardwood floor and so you know immediately you go to work and you start filling in all the gaps on the hardwood floor and you're you know you're you're redoing the paint job because there's mess there's you know a problem with the paint job and you do all these little little work and then finally you walk around the whole house and you see hey there's no toilet right you have an entire three-bedroom house with no toilet well that's a big problem 
And you have to fix that problem first. You have to address those big problems first before wasting time focusing on all those individual tiny little problems. Because if you start doing all that nitty gritty individual editing of, of grammar and spelling and all that, what the problem is that you might end up not using that entire chapter in your book in the first, you might remove that chapter or you might add new chapters in, you might move chapters around, you might have to rewrite entire scenes or chapters or sections of your book. And so rather than wasting time doing that process, if you start at the book level first, make sure that the book is organized properly, that everything works and then move down then you will not be wasting time doing work that's just going to be redone anyways. So start at the book level, read through the whole manuscript, make sure that your book works. Make sure there's nothing missing. Make sure everything's in the right order. After you've done that, you want to go through and edit at the chapter level, right? So this is where you're going to go through each chapter. Make sure each chapter is structured and organized properly. Everything that needs to be in that chapter is there. All the chapters are in the right order, et cetera, et cetera. Then you're going to start editing at the paragraph level, right? And this is when you're going to go through and make sure that all the paragraphs are in the right order. They're organized properly. There's a clear flow from one paragraph to the next to the next, right? The reader's not getting stuck anywhere. And then you're going to edit at the sentence level. And that's where you go through to make sure each sentence is in order. It's all organized properly. There's a great flow from sentence to sentence. Um, everything is there. All right, and then you're going to edit at the individual word level. And this is where you're going to go and you know use your thesaurus and dictionary and you're going to check out the usage and make sure that the ideas you thought you were communicating are the ones that are actually being communicated with the words that you're using and so on and so forth. And by going through that process of starting big and then going small, you're not going to waste time redoing work right? Because you're going to focus on the biggest problems first, fix the big problems first, and then focus on the smaller problems and smaller problems and smaller problems. And that is the most organized, efficient way to go through this process, okay? Now, these levels track pretty similarly pretty similarly to the uh, kind of traditional publishing uh, editing roles, right? So the, you know, the first kind of most basic level of editing is called developmental editing. And that's really when you take the rough story and turn it into a book. So a lot of times when folks hire a developmental editor, you know, they've got a book and, and, and it's, you know, they've got the idea there, they've got, you know, maybe 50,000, 70,000 words or whatever it is, um, but it's not quite there. Right, they haven't really finished the book. That it's not even quite to the end of the first draft yet, because there's something missing. Maybe there's chapters missing, and stuff needs to be reorganized. That's really what development editing gets into: is getting the first draft of the book done, making sure that you know they're they're editing the book on the book level. They're making sure that the book works as a book, that the reader goes from one place in chapter one and ends up at the end of the end of the book, and that it all flows from beginning to end. Right, and so that's developmental editing. Then there's line editing, and line editing is like you know making sure that the words, the sentences, the paragraphs clearly communicate the ideas you intend to communicate. Right, it's a, it's, a, it's not uh, right. It's a little more detailed. Right, it's not look working at the book level. It's more working at the chapter and the paragraph and the word level and the sentence level to make sure that the ideas you think you're communicating are the ones you're actually communicating to the reader. Then there is copy editing, and copy editing is the most basic, right? It's the it's kind of the most fundamental word level, a sentence level, making sure that the spelling is right, fixing errors, the grammar, punctuation, syntax, consistency, you know, making sure there's the right fonts and capitalization and fact checking, and there's not amb ambiguous language and so forth, right? And that's like the nitty gritty stuff. Right, and so you want to go through from top level to bottom level, and that's how you do it. And then the final uh, area of editing for professional editors is, you know, the final edit for publishing, which is called proofreading. And that's really just fixing the minor mistakes and spelling and punctuation, and spacing and layout and so forth. Right. So you wouldn't hire a proofreader, you wouldn't hire a proofreader before you've gone through the line editing. Right, so you wouldn't hire a proofreader before you've gone through copy editing, and you wouldn't hire a copy editor before you've gone through line editing, and you wouldn't hire a develop, uh, line editor before you go through developmental editing. Now, you don't have to hire all four types of editors every time for every project, but when you're doing the editing yourself and going through the self-editing process, this is how you want to think about the process. Start at the top level first and work your way down to the minute details. Now, here's a couple tips to make the self-editing process more effective and more efficient for you. So one of the things I highly recommend you do is print out your manuscript and edit it by hand at least twice. So I know most folks, you're probably editing on your computer or your laptop, you know, using a word processor. 
And that's great. That's, that's wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that. I think it's one of the best ways to edit your work. But you will get a different perspective when you print out your manuscript. By printing it out, editing it at least twice by hand, you will see mistakes. You will use a different part of your brain when you edit it by hand, and you'll see mistakes that you would never saw, see on the computer screen simply because you're activating different parts of your brain, so you're going to notice different things. And using the same principle, you can also edit your manuscript by voice, which I highly recommend. You speak out your manuscript out loud at least twice and make edits based on your read-through out loud. And again, this is going to activate different parts of your brain. So when you speak your manuscript out loud, you'll, you'll notice that some words just don't sound right when you speak them. And so you want to go ahead and make those edits based on your experience of speaking your manuscript out loud. Okay, now the next step is to start working with professional editors. So once you've gone through that self-editing process, you start at the top level, all the way down to the bottom level, all the minute details, and you've done the best job you know how to do with your current skill set. That's when it's time to bring in a professional editor. And so one of the principles you want to understand when you're working with a professional editor is you want to be humble, right? Don't let your ego get in the way of you learning and you being successful. It's one of the most common mistakes I see folks make when they hire editors. They think, oh, no, the editor doesn't know what they're talking about. I'm right. This is the best way to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And you don't learn, right? Now, you don't have to accept every change your editors want to make. In fact, they don't expect you to. No good editor will expect you to accept every change they recommend. But you want to be humble, pretend you know nothing, be open and willing to learn every single time with every single mistake and critique of your work. The more open you are to learning, the more you're going to learn. The more you learn, the faster you will make progress, the better you will get. And the faster you make progress and the better you get, guess what? The more money you're going to make, right? Just makes sense. So when you're working with an editor, here's one thing you need to know for new folks starting out. Look, if it is not painful if it is not a painful process for you to read your editor's comments, something is very wrong, right? Either you don't care about your work enough, and so you know there's all these edits and red ink everywhere, and you're just you're not you're not emotionally reacting to it because you don't care enough about your work, or you've hired an editor who's not really challenging you. They're not really picking up all the mistakes you're making. They're not really well trained, and there's not red ink all over the page. So there better be red ink all over the page, especially if you're a new writer, because I'm guaranteeing you, if you're a brand new writer, it's your first book. You have made tons of mistakes. Even after editing your manuscript 75 times, there will still be tons of mistakes and tons of room for improvement. And so if your editor is not picking up on that, you have not hired the kind of editor who's going to challenge you and give you the feedback you really need to be as successful as possible. So if you're wondering how do you find a great editor, I've written a very detailed article all about that. You can go to tckpublishing.com slash editors, and that will walk you through the entire process to find really great editors to work with to help you polish and improve your manuscript. And that article will also help you understand, you know, how much should you be paying for an editor, making sure you're not overpaying for an editor. Because again, this is another common mistake that folks make is that, you know, you hire your neighbor's best friend's uncle to edit your manuscript and you just give them the manuscript and send it off and they send you a bill for $5,000 or $10,000 and you just pay it because you think that's normal, but it's not. You got ripped off, right? And you got ripped off because you didn't do your research. So do your research. Make sure you're getting multiple quotes for every project. Make sure you're testing out multiple editors with free sample edits to see which is the best editor for you for your specific project and make sure you find that good fit and make sure you're paying reasonable rates and not getting ripped off. And so go to tckpublishing.com slash editors, read that article, study it, follow that process, and you'll be well on your way to finding a great editor for your book. Okay, now step five, the fifth thing you can do to really increase your income is marketing, right? Marketing and promotion. And so here's the deal. Marketing is all about long-term success. Promotion is about short-term success and short-term sales. So which is more important to you, right? Do you want long-term success and long-term sales and long-term income or short-term short success, short-term sales, and short-term income, right? For me, it's a no-brainer. I want long-term success. I want income month after month after month, year after year after year without having to worry about it, right? And that's what marketing allows you to do. That's what great marketing allows you to do is have long-term results and long-term success, uh, promotion is really about, you know, posting your book on BookBub and Buck Books and all the different book promotion sites. And promotion is great. It lets you get a lot of sales in a short period of time, which is wonderful. But promotion alone will not make you successful long term. It is not going to allow you to achieve your long term goals and long term dreams just through promotion alone. So promotion is great. I recommend you, you promote as much as you can. 
it just makes sense to do so. But you also need to be focusing on marketing, long-term success and long-term marketing. It is by far the most important thing you can do to guarantee long-term sales and long-term income is learning how to become a great marketer. And that's a skill set. You know, and most writers just don't have that skill set. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Every great writer, every great marketer started out at zero with no skills in marketing whatsoever. And you can learn these skills if you're willing to put the time, effort, energy into doing it. And so when I'm working with clients at TCK Publishing, the number one thing I'm always talking about in terms of marketing is, look, you have to focus on your marketing strengths. You have to focus on what you're strong at, what you're good at, what you love to do, because marketing is a long-term game. Right, look, look at Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola has been advertising on TV and radio and newspapers for over a hundred years. And they're still doing it. Why are they still running ads on TV after a hundred years of nonstop marketing with the same ads and the same company and the same product, right? It's because they know that it works. They know it works and so they keep doing it. And so when we're talking about marketing, you have to find out what works for you and keep doing it day after day after day, week after week after week, month after month after month, year after year after year. And if that sounds exhausting to you, then that's because either you don't love marketing and you haven't found a way to use your strengths, or you're not really committed, right? And so what you wanna do is find your strengths, find the things that you love to do in terms of marketing, and do that every day. And it, do it the things that don't feel like work for you that you love to do that you would do even if you weren't getting paid for it. And that will end up being the best marketing for you because you'll be doing it the most consistently, again, day after day after day, week after week after week, month after month after month. That's how you create long-term success. And so here are the most common skill sets I've found among writers and how you can actually monetize them and make money using your skills. So if writing is really your strong suit and your passion and you're one of those folks, you can just write three, four, five, six hours a day every single day without without ever taking a break, you just love it, then you might want to think about, in addition to writing books, you know, blogging, right? Guest blogging, uh, writing articles, um, you know, for Huffington Post and other big uh, online websites and newspapers and so forth, right? And then, of course, writing more books. So if writing is your strength, focus on how you can use your writing to get more exposure for your work and for what you're doing. So if you love speaking, if you love teaching and you know, teaching workshops and doing interviews and public speaking, and it doesn't feel like work to you, then do that and do it consistently. So you can do things like radio, TV, podcasts, interviews, public speaking, seminars, workshops, conferences. Use your speaking skills as much as possible to get the word about to get the word out about you and the work that you're doing. And that will allow you to create great marketing and great sales long term if you're consistently speaking. If that's your strength and that's something you love to do. Now, another great strength a lot of folks have is technology and kind of ads. These are the kind of folks who, you know, you tend to be introverted, tend to be, you know, maybe programmers or web designers or, uh, you know, advertisers or, you know, you like to work with computers, you like to be in the background. And so you can do things in the background without ever talking to anyone, without ever picking up the phone and calling people. You know, you can use your computer to do great marketing long term. And so this is where a lot of like online advertising comes in. So like Google ads and Amazon ads and Facebook ads and native ads and all different kinds of advertising and, and marketing things that you can do online that don't require, you know, you necessarily like creating videos or doing interviews or uh, picking up the phone and things like that. So if that's your strength, Focus on using that strength. And that's something you love to do. Like if you love, you know, you just love the idea of going to Facebook ads and finding out how they work and studying them and testing out, you know, a hundred different campaigns with, you know, split tests and all these different images and so forth and so forth. If that's something that you love to do, by all means do that. You can be very, very successful with that. But again, if that's not your skill set, if it's not your strength, don't bother because you're not going to be successful unless you hire someone who it is their skill set and their strength to join your team to help you with that. But if that's not your strength, don't focus on it long term because you're not going to be successful long term if you're working on your weaknesses. Work on your strengths. That's how you create long term success. Now, another great strength a lot of folks have, uh, and this is very common, but very few folks uh, I found really understand how to use this strength properly. And so that's kind of like the creative builder mindset, like the creative builder strength. So, you know, if you're like a woodworker, uh, you like to use your hands, carpentry tools, you like to build stuff, make things, maybe you're a painter, an artist, a sculptor, you can use your creativity, your skills 
to build things, to build stuff worth talking about. You can create something worth talking about. You can create something memorable that the media will want to talk about and bloggers will want to talk about and so forth. So, you know, for example, uh, my dad is a woodworker and he loves to create stuff out of wood. I mean, he's made bowls and tables and most of the furniture in our house growing up he made. Uh, he's made canoes and all this stuff, right? So, you know, if you were an author and you had those skills to make stuff out of wood, you know, think about making something out of wood. Uh, think about using your skills to build something that ties in with your books. If you're writing, you know, fantasy novels, you can make dragon figurines, right? You can make them in your workshop and, you know, post them on your website and share them on social media and tell the media and tell bloggers about, you know, the cool figurines you've created in your workshop to, you know, represent the dragons in your novels and so forth. Right. Think about how you can build something unique, how you can build something different that people want to talk about. You know, the number one reason people buy books is still word of mouth. Right. And so the really the point of marketing is to get people talking about what you're doing. And so you can, you know, create great videos, you can create great interviews, you can build, you know, figurines and, and build things that people talk about. You know, you can write articles that people talk about. You know, you can find out how to use your unique strengths. And create something that other people want to talk about and share. And that's how you create long-term success. Now, having said that, there is one marketing strategy that every author should be using no matter what your skill set is, no matter uh, what you're good at, what you're bad at. You absolutely should be using email marketing. If you are not using email marketing, it's like taking a gun and shooting yourself in the foot because you are holding yourself back from success. Industry statistics are that the average return on investment, ROI, for email marketing is 3,800%. What that means is that for every $1 you spend on email marketing, on average, you're gonna earn $39 in sales. $1 you spend, $39 in sales. I don't know any other marketing strategy anywhere in the world that gets those kind of results consistently day after day, year after year with entrepreneurs, authors, marketers in every field and every industry. It is unbelievable how profitable email marketing is, how amazing it is, how it can transform your business. When I launch books now, when clients launch books, we're always using email marketing because it gets the biggest return. Right, it, it, it's just a no-brainer. It's the number one best way to connect with your audience. You look at email open rates for email marketing on average, it's like 22%. You know, when you compare that to, you know, the rate of people who see your posts on Facebook or Twitter, it's like, you know, 2% or 1%, sometimes less. So, you know, if you've got a million Facebook fans, you're only gonna get maybe one or 2% of them actually open, you know, actually see what you're posting and respond. But if you send an email out to a thousand people, you're going to get a 22% response rate on average, which means you're going to get out of 1,000 people, 220 people responding to what you send, reading your email, clicking your links, buying your books. You can have a very tiny email list and sell hundreds of books every time you launch a book. And if you haven't learned this already, if you sell 100 books in the first day using one email to your audience, one, e one email to your list, that will put you on number one in over 80% of the best-selling best seller lists or best-seller categories on Amazon. So email marketing is not only the best way to launch a book for short-term promotion results, but it's the best way to get long-term sales because you can build up your audience over time. And as you launch new books or release new books or update your books, you can let your audience know through your email list and sell more that way. You can also sell other products and services outside of your books to your audience. So once you've built that audience, you can sell other things to them. You can sell merchandise and video games and you know all kinds of stuff you can promote to your audience based on their interests and their needs and what you have to offer. And you can increase your income dramatically using email marketing. So if you've never started email marketing before, you don't know how to get started, here are the three main tools you can use. So and I'll have links to all these underneath the video so you can check them out and, and compare them. So first one is called MailChimp. Uh, a lot of folks have heard of this. It's, it's free to start. That's why most folks love it because you know there's no cost at all to get started. Once you get about 2,000 email subscribers, then they start charging you a little bit every month. Uh, but it's free to get started. So if you don't have a big budget, by all means, start with MailChimp. Uh, the one I use is called Aweber. It's cheap, it's reliable, it starts at like $20 a month. Uh, it's a great service. Uh, I love that their support uh, is amazing. They'll, they've walked me through so many different things. I just call them up on the phone anytime I have a problem and they walk me through everything I need to do to solve those problems. And so I find that this like, it's like having a new employee on my team. It's like having someone full-time on my team doing tech support so I can just call them on the phone. They'll walk me through whatever problem I'm having and help me solve that. So I love that about Aweber. And it's just been a great service for me over the past you know, seven years or so. 
Uh, and then active campaign is one new one. I'm actually start testing this out for a couple different campaigns we're using. And so far it's worked really great. Uh, and so what I like about active campaign is that it's a little bit pricier than AWeber, but it gives you a lot more options and more advanced targeting, advanced segmenting options. So if you're a more advanced marketer, and you know that there are more advanced uh, campaigns you want to launch. You know you want to target people who clicked a certain link but not that link, or who bought a certain product or book from you but not another product or book from you. Active Campaign allows you to do that and manage that really effectively, really easily. So that's another great tool to use as well. So it doesn't really matter what tool you use. What matters is that you start using a tool, you start building your landing page, and you start building your email list today. The faster you start building your email list, the bigger it's going to get, the more sales you're going to make, right? It's no brainer. This video is all about how do you increase your income. If you haven't started building your email marketing list today, you need to start right now. So if you're ready to start building your email list today, I have a book. It's called Email Marketing Mastery. It walks you through the entire process step by step by step. You can get it at tckpublishing.com slash emm. It'll take you to the page on Amazon. It's like $5 for the Kindle version. Uh, it'll walk you through everything you need to know. I also have a video training course that's far more advanced that walks you through everything through video. So you can see over my shoulder, you know, where I click on the screen, uh, how does I set up my entire email marketing campaigns, and you can follow along with that as well. And the link to that will be underneath this video. So whether you want to get the book or watch the video course, Get the training, get the information you need to start building your email list like a professional because it will help you increase your income like nothing else out there. Okay, wow, we have covered a ton of information in this video and it's time for a quick checkup. So I want you to, to write down now, get your notebook out, get your pen and paper out and ask yourself, open up a new page, ask yourself, look, how much time have you spent in your career as an author on market research and just do your best your best to estimate. You don't have to get it perfect, right? Same thing like when you're outlining a book, when you're plotting a book, you don't have to get it perfect. Just do the best you know how to do right now in this moment. That's all anyone can ask of you. Do the best you can do right now in this moment. That's all you could ever ask of yourself. How much time would you guess you spent on market research? How much time have you spent on creative writing? How much time have you spent on self-editing? And how much time have you spent on long-term marketing? And how much time have you spent on email marketing? Right, those are the, the big factors that are gonna determine your income. How much time have you spent on this stuff? Right, and give yourself an honest assessment. And then look at the results, look at the numbers, and ask yourself, look, is that enough? Like, where, where, is, where are you weak, right? Out of all these different areas, all these different things you can do to increase your income, where are you weak? Where do you need more experience? Where do you need more practice? Where do you need more discipline, right? Because if you're not focusing on all these different areas, it's gonna be really tough to be successful. That's just the truth. So again, we're gonna talk about in the first video that it's not about just the one thing that you do is gonna make you successful. It's about the combination, opening up that combination lock to success. Well, this is it. These are the things you can do to increase your income. And if you aren't getting this combination right, if you're not focusing enough time on each of these areas, it's gonna be really tough to be successful. So give yourself this honest assessment and then take action, right? Create a plan now of action that's gonna allow you to create success and, and to achieve your dreams. And so this is what I would recommend for everyone listening right now. Commit to your own success. Here is the plan that I think at a minimum you will need to be really successful and earn a full-time income as an author. First of all, when it comes to market research, you're gonna have to do this constantly. So I walked you through earlier about the market research process. You need to go do that. You might wanna spend at least two, three days, you know, 20 hours plus, when you first start out doing this, really getting crystal clear on who your customers are, what they want, reading all those reviews, reading the first couple pages of the best-selling books in your market, really study this stuff, really commit to it full time. Once you've gone through that kind of initial phase of market research, you don't have to do it you know, every uh, hours of, for every day. You just wanna go through that initial phase so you can get crystal clear on who your audience is. Once you get a good feeling for that, then market research becomes something you do constantly. So when you get emails from folks, you're paying attention. What are they saying? What are the words they're using? What are the key phrases they're using? You know, you jot down notes based on the, the emails you hear and the conversations you have with customers because you're learning more about them. So market research is something you do constantly, but when you're just starting out, you need to do it much more intensely. Okay, and then creative writing, right? That's something you need to do, I think a minimum an hour a day. You know, if you really want a full-time income. So that's an hour each day, seven days a week. And notice it just says creative writing, right? That's creative writing. That's writing new words on page. That's not editing, right? So write new words on page one hour each day. So when you're editing your book, you should still be working on your next book. I think that's the best way to do it. Now, not everyone agrees with me, but the reason I like that habit of working every day on creative writing, every day writing new material, is that I never get stuck. 
right? I always have that habit. I always have that momentum. I'm always creating new material. So if I have a bad day, if an editor quits on me, uh, you know, if my website goes down, if I get a bad review on Amazon, like whatever happens, I've still got momentum on my side. I'm still creating new words. I'm still creating new work. And that gives me the confidence to know that I'm making forward progress and I'm never getting stuck, okay? That's why I think you should be writing at least one hour a day on creative writing. Now for self-editing, this is something you're just gonna do as it comes up, right? So you're not gonna edit your first book until you're done with the first draft, right? And so when you're done with the first draft, then you're gonna be editing intensely. So creative writing is a thing you're gonna be doing constantly every single day, year round. Self-editing is something you're gonna do in phases and spurts as each book is finished and you need to go through the editing process, okay? Now long-term marketing this is something you wanna do at least 30 minutes each day. You really want to focus on using your strengths, like we talked about before, to create great marketing that's going to give you long-term results. You know, Jack Canfield started the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, and they've sold, uh, I think, over 100 million books now. I mean, he's one of the most successful authors ever, right? And when he started with his partner, Mark Victor Hansen, they both committed every single day to doing five things to sell their books. They would make five phone calls. They would make five connections every single day to sell their books. And you can do that in 30 minutes. You can make five phone calls in 30 minutes. You can work on a new article, a new blog post, You know, build something cool that people are gonna talk about. Use your strengths, whatever your strengths are, to do something 30 minutes each day, every day, seven days a week, to market your books, to sell your books. If you do that, you will be successful. All right, now in the next video, we're gonna talk about how to overcome the biggest obstacles that hold most authors back from achieving long-term success. So, you know, once you've got your plan in place, like we just talked about, you're focusing on these five key activities that are gonna increase your income, there's still some things that can trip you up, right? There's still some obstacles that can come up uh, that can stop you in your tracks. And, and I'm sure you've seen this happen to other folks, you know, they had everything going for them, they had a great life, their first book came out, it was super successful, and then, their career just stopped, right? What happened? What happens when someone achieves a certain level of success and they just stop? Well, there are some things that we as human beings face, some challenges and struggles that we face along the way. So the next video, I'm gonna talk about what are those main challenges that we face? What are the things that can, that can just destroy our career in a very short period of time? And how can we protect ourselves and insulate ourselves from those obstacles? How can we overcome them so that we're constantly moving forward, constantly making progress toward our goals and toward our dreams? And that's what we're gonna talk about in the next video. So if you love this video, if you found it helpful, please do like it below, subscribe on YouTube, leave a comment. If you know other authors, other writers out there who want to earn a full-time income and they're just stuck, they don't know what to do, they don't know how to achieve their goals, they're not sure where they should be focusing their time, what they should be doing, please share this free video training series with them. I know they're gonna find it so helpful and so valuable and you will change their life by sharing this video. So please go ahead and do that. Also, please share this with your local writers group. Uh, you know, any conferences you go to for writers, please share this with folks. It's gonna make a huge difference in their lives. Now, if you have any questions about anything we've covered in this video or the first video, please just post your questions in the comments below and me and my team will do our very best to get you all the information you need to succeed. Again, this is Tom Corson Knowles, best-selling author of Secrets of the Six-Figure Author, founder of TCK Publishing. I'm wishing you an incredible day full of success. I know I'm glad you've got your plan in place now for success. So go out there, take action. Every day, work towards your goals and your dreams, and you will be successful. All right, see you in the next video. Take care.